All right. So this is lecture 14 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, what we're going to be talking about is, in the last lecture, we talked about the sampling of bandpass signals, how we can play around, sample at a lower rate, and still be able to, with some planning at, at wherever we reconstruct our signal from the sampled version, we can actually recover the sampled version of the signal and not have ali any aliasing. Okay? So we can play some tricks. Now, like, you know, some people might say, can you sample a sampled signal? Yes. Yes, you can. So this is how you can do it. Okay, so just like before, I'm not going to, like, hide anything. I'm just going to, like, just, I'm going to be a really awful mystery novel writer, and I'm just going to say, oh, it was the butler. Okay? And so this is, this is what I mean. Okay. So we know... So let's say here's time, and here's frequency, okay? In the time domain, we have, let's say, something that looks like this, right? In the frequency domain, we have a signal spectra that might look like that, right? And so what happens when we sample? So this is continuous, right? So if we sample... What happens? So let's say every t seconds, I take a value from my continuous time signal. Do, 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 do. Yeah, and that's actually how sampling sounds like. You know. So what ends up happening is I get this, this. Right? And we know when we sample, that we're going to have this, and we're going to get periodic replicas at fs and minus fs, and so on and so forth, right? So now what we're interested in doing is, suppose we sample the sample version of that waveform. Can it be done? Absolutely. Like, in fact, where does this come up? So here's... Like for folks like Renato and Caitlin, who are in my, my radio course, this happens more frequently than not, right? 512, right? Right? Right. So what happens is, where would we do such a thing? Like most people would say, well, I sampled the waveform. My microprocessor can handle it, right? No. The answer is no. It turns out... Maybe your analog to digital, digital analog converter can sample pretty nicely. So, for instance, the reason why I, I, I brought up um, the, these two guys in particular is they're taking my undergraduate software-defined radio and digital comms class. And what happens is on this software-defined radio, it has a 100 mega sample per second A to D, D to A converter. So it's like, D -d 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 -d. it's sampling like mad. What happens is that sampling rate cannot be supported by the microprocessor system attached to it. So you have the radio, and all it does is it takes analog signal over the air, brings it to DC, samples it 100 mega samples per second, and if you did nothing else from there, it would just take those 100 mega samples per second, packetize it into UDB packets, send it by gigabit Ethernet to a computer where you would have software to transform it into a message like Hello World. <laughs> Sorry teasing. So, you might say, so what? Modern computer technology? It should be easy, right? Not necessarily. What happens is, suppose your computer is not the fastest. Let's say your computer was fast. What happens is 100 mega samples per second on a general purpose microprocessor system, and perhaps you don't have the latest and greatest computer system, your computer will not be able to ha handle that much data. It's going to, like, essentially choke. So what's going to happen is, if you were transmitting and your computer cannot get samples out fast enough, what you're going to get over the air is something like a burst of information, dead air. Burst of information, dead air. Burst of information, dead air. It's awful. 
That's actually bad in like wireless communication world because what happens is this sort of like on off on off on off on off behavior you're just asking for lots of out of band emission. It's not not really not great. And then on the receiver side what you're doing is you're clogging up your computer with data. It basically your computer is like, "Oh my god, I can't handle all of this." And then data begins to drop off before you can even process it. So you're losing data. So on one end, you have a suboptimal scheme. You're, you're not being able to transmit fast enough. On the other hand, you're unable to decode fast enough and you're dropping data that you could decode. So what do we do? We take the sample data and it turns out that these little radio units have little FPGAs on them and these FPGAs subsample the sample data to something that your software on your general purpose microprocessor system can handle. It turns out, and I tell my students this in that class, I say, try downsampling by 512. So what does that mean? I take the 100, 100 mega samples per second and I say, throw away every 511 out of 512 samples. You might say, oh, it's okay. That's totally fine. And what happens is, the computers they're using can totally handle the samples at that rate. I have some students, you know, they're testing the limits. They downsample by only 128. Mm, you know, they have some, maybe some good computers there and they can handle it. I think one student of mine has gone down all the way to 16 and that's pushing it because the performance was kind of like on the edge. But what we do in reality, why we downsample sample data is because for a lot of reasons, maybe our microprocessor system cannot handle it. So suppose instead of having an i7 processor, you have a Raspberry Pi. You have an ARM Cortex A9. You have some sort of microprocessor system that just can't keep up. So you might have to subsample the, the data that's coming in. And when we do that, this creates a whole new type of situation. So let's say you're in my software-defined radio class, and then, some of you are, so, and then I say, I'm going to keep this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. So I'm going to subsample. So doop, 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 doop. So what, what does this look like? So one, now, I'm having, like, you know, there's all this emptiness in between these samples. My microprocessor system's like, okay, this is cool. I can actually handle this, as opposed to this. This thing is like a tsunami of samples pouring in. And the microprocessor system is saying, I can't do this. I, I, I give up. I surrender. Now it can handle it. But what's the problem? Sampling the sample data like this is like sampling this signal at that rate. And what happens if we don't sample, if this subsampling is less than Nyquist? Aliasing. So what we got to be careful about is that if we sample the sample data a little too, uh, we, we don't sample it sufficiently, those periodic replicas that we have begin to overlap with each other. This is actually the problem that we have in, in the lab. If you, like, actually not so much, because what we try and do is the transmitter has the same sort of sampling rate as the receiver, and then we expand it and we contract it. So we make sure that the signal that's coming out of our transmitter is band limited enough and narrow enough that at the receiver, even if we downsample by 512, there's no aliasing. But let's suppose that the band limited signal in here did not have the same consideration. Then we run into difficulties, right? So we have to be careful how we sample the sample information, all right? So this is, so in essence, when we sample the sample data, what we're doing ultimately is actually sampling the original continuous time waveform, but at that new revised rate. And when we do that, we've got to be very careful that we don't run into something like this. 
So that's really the punchline of lecture, lecture 14. It's really that. So I know. So why am I even showing slides? So what happens is, if we cut to the chase, this is the diagram that I was talking about. So what ends up happening is, like at the bottom what you see is essentially, if you have your original sample data, and then you sample the sample data, and then you sample the sampled sample data, <laughs> what you end up getting is those replicas are coming awfully close to each other, and in the last case, they actually overlap, and that's bad. And so, uh, mathematically, how do we represent that? Well, what we do is we take the initial expression where we have xA of f, and what happens to xA of f when we sample it? When we get x of f, it's going to be periodic replicas from minus infinity to infinity. They're all spaced out by multiples of fs. When we then sample by a factor of d those sampled information, what ends up happening is that modifies fs. Now we have fs over d. Now our sampling rate is actually being decreased by a factor of d. And our replicas, the multiple, now that k factor, now we're not having as much a buffer. And the more we downsample, the closer those replicas get together. That's what the math here is representing. So that is what I'm concerned about, is the aliasing risk. If you have a well-designed band-limited signal and you do this, you're fine, right? Like in, in, my, in my course, in my software-defined radio course, we make sure that the transmitted bandwidth is, is always matched to what we're downsampling at the receiver. Like, I'm not sure, unless you guys are, like, doing 1024 at the receiver in 5 that, that shouldn't work at all, right? I don't even think you can do 1024 with those radios. No? No. Okay. Don't bother doing it now. <laughs> okay. And then you might ask about reconstruction. Bless you. So the reconstruction formula is just the same as before. Remember that, ideally, what do we want to do? We want to filter out. So let's go back to this guy. Boop. So remember what happened in the, uh, several classes ago when we talked about sampling. So let's say we have that, we have that, we have that. We, so we have the original replica, and we have all these periodic signals, right? And so we, we saw what happened if we wanted to take this guy and we want to return him back to this, right? So that is our x a of f. This guy is x of f. And to recover, to recover the original signal from the sampled version, what do you do? What you do is you, in an ideal world, you filter the replica, right? In order to do that, what we do is we take x a of f, pass it through an ideal low-pass filter, and we get x a of f, sorry. So x of f, x a of f, low-pass filter. And what do we know about this, this guy? So what happens is, uh, let's say this guy here is h of f. And we know that x a of f is equal to h of f times x of f, uh, x of f, or in the time domain, x a of uh, t, h of t, convolved with x of t, right? So we've got this guy. And what we notice is that what is this guy? Right, this ideal brick wall low pass filter, what is he in the time domain? Time domain? It's a sync pulse. So that's how, under ideal circumstances, when we want recovered sampled data, what we do is for what we do is we convolve every sample with a sync pulse. Now, let's let's take this one step further, okay? Mm. Discard. So let's take this one step further. So we know that just, 
just to recall from last class. So what we've got is we have h of n. We know that in the time domain, he looks like this. Ah, h of t, sorry. Wrong domain. So we've got that. This is what we want out. We want a reconstructed version of our original signal. This is what's going in. And this guy here, so that's our h of t. This guy here is essentially a, a um, period, um, uniformly spaced delta functions with different amplitude values. So let's say that's c1, c2, c3, c4, c5, c6, c7, c8, and so on. What do we know when we convolve a delta train with sinc functions? What we get is essentially we have those sinc pulses, and it's going to look like that, right? And then this sinc pulse is going to look like that. And then this sync pulse is going to be applied. So what we essentially get is shifted, vertically scaled sync pulses all summed together. And that's what actually creates our reconstructed, our ideal reconstructed waveform at the output. So if you sum this together, so you sum all these guys together, what you're going to get Aye. What you're going to get is something that has an envelope based on those deltas. Okay? So that, that's what you get when you sum all those sync pulses together. But there are several problems. Sync pulses must stretch from minus infinity to infinity. Not practical. It's also not practical to have a perfect rectangular waveform. Not practical. So a lot of people are thinking, OK, what are some sort of workarounds around this problem? Discard. And the answer is, uh, there are a few. But one technique is something called linear interpolation. So linear interpolation um, is kind of a nice little trick. So what linear interpolation does is just put a triangle. So instead of putting sync pulses, which extend from minus infinity to infinity, whoop, triangle. OK, so let, let me go back to drawing. Oh, I love drawing. So what you got is, let's go back to that example. So you can either do, and then let's say we have an identical copy here or best I can draw it. As you can see, drawing is not my strong suit. So what happens is we can either do the sync pulse thing, OK? You get, you get the gist, right? So I'm not going to draw it perfectly. OK. Or what you can do is suppose you draw a triangle like that. And you just superimpose one triangle over another, over another, over another, over another, over another, over another, and over another. So here, what you're going to get is a nice, smooth waveform that does that, right? And the sampling instances are perfect to what these delta locations are, right? Because what we know about sync pulses is that they are going to be 0 with exception of the desired sampling instant, which is going to be 1. So every time there's a 0 crossing, it's going to be 0, with the exception of the desired peak, which therefore we're actually preserving that value of delta, right? I can trick this by using linear interpolation. So this is ideal. And this is linear. So if I do this, what do I get? I get something that looks more like Picasso. What I'm going to get is essentially here nothing's added. So doop. 
Then I add this slope and that slope, so what I get is something that kind of bridges the two together. Doop. Then I get another one that bridges there. Doop. And then so on. So boop, 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 boop. So essentially what it is is linear connect the dots. So try it at home. Take a triangle that's basically the width of 2t. Take another triangle and another triangle and another triangle. Sum it together and what you're going to get is connecting the dots of all the heads of the deltas. So what, on the one hand, it doesn't look pretty. What happens is you're going to have this sharp, jagged looking thing that doesn't look like the ideal interpolation. Instead, what is nice about this? First of all, the ideal assumes an uh, infinite, uh, infinite time domain signal of your sync pulse. Here, I'm just asking for something that's 2t wide, right? That's the first one. And then the second one is, how does this look like in the frequency domain? And the answer is quite nice. What it'll look like, let's go ahead, is this. In the frequency domain, it looks like a sync squared pulse, right? So you might say, where did sync squared come from? OK, so think about it. So sync pulse is rectangular in the time domain if sync is in the frequency domain. How do, so what is a triangular pulse? How do you get a triangular pulse? the convolution of two rectangular pulses, right? So if I wanted to create from a rectangular pulse, so, so I know that this guy, okay, so let's say that's uh, minus t over 2 to t over 2, and that's 0. What happens is, if I convolve him with himself, okay, what I get at the end of the day is a triangular pulse. It's a little bit of potpourri. That is minus t to t, right? So we know that the convolution of these two square pulses will give me a triangular pulse. So in the time domain representation, the, like, you know, can you implement a square pulse? Absolutely. Do you want to create a triangular pulse? Convolve two square pulses. Absolutely feasible. Spectrum-wise, what does this look like? So what is convolution in the frequency domain? Multiplication. What are these, each one of these guys in the frequency domain? Sync. So what I've got, and these are two identical sinks, so this guy here is sync squared. So what we'll get is instead of having something that looks like this, what we instead get is we're going to get, we're not going to get any negative values and everything is basically a squared amplitude, right? So that's where we get this graphic from. And so this is why linear interpolation is much nicer than the ideal, because we have now a practical waveform we can implement, right? And what happens is also in terms of the frequency response, sure, it's not an ideal brick wall filter that the ideal looks like, but um, just like when I do home renovations, yeah, it's good enough, right? I can live with this. I can't live with my deck, but I can live with this, okay? So that's why linear interpolation, is, a lot of folks use that over the ideal because it's practical, because it's sufficient for a lot of applications, and, and, we can, and, and so we can reconstruct our signal using this technique. Okay, so there was a question, and, there, and this is related to section 6.6 .6, uh, from in the textbook about delta sigma or sigma delta modulation. Okay, so this is something that I had to look into, and 
so I knew that this diagram, like, you know, when I explained it in the last class, it's like, oh, yeah, so there's this one-bit quantizer or uh, A to D converter that's acting on this. But there, wait, there's more. So, so what delta sigma mod or sigma delta modulation, what this does is it makes the assumption. So first of all, it operates the f on the fact that we are sampling at a ridiculously high rate. And that all we need is a one-bit resolution digital to analog converter. But there is actually more going on than just, just this. So, so if you look online, if you read in a textbook and stuff, how does a, a sigma delta modulator work? Okay, It looks like this. So I actually pulled it up. Uh, let me... So sigma delta modulator. I behave. I. Okay. So the way it looks like is the following. So you have an input signal. Right. Here's an adder. You've got this guy. He's an integrator. Right? Then you've got some sort of comparator. So th this guy does some sort of um, comparator. Okay. See, spelling is not my strong suit either. So what a comparator does is essentially, is it above this value? Yes, one. If it's below this value, no, zero. And so you have some sort of uh, V ref, reference signal. And so this produces an output bit stream. Okay, but wait, there's more. What happens is this guy then goes through a one-bit DAC, digital to analog converter. So what happens is digitization happens at the comparator. The comparator basically says, are you above or below this voltage level? Yes or no? And it says one or zero, right? It's a, it's a simple, simple circuit or component. Like, so, if any of you play with ultrasonic sensors, um, like the El Cheapo ones, like you, like you have on a VEX robot or something like that, um, you know, it's a, great it's a great ultrasonic sensor, but at the core of it, there's a small voltage comparator that says, is this reflection of the acoustic sound wave, or whatever that I'm emitting, the ultrasonic pulse that I'm sending, what I'm picking up, is it louder than the threshold or less than the threshold? If it's louder, Boop, one, the object is near. Nope, zero, the object is not near. It's a binary decision, right? The more fancy ultrasonic sensors give you range, but the very simple ones say close, not close. Same thing with, let's say, automotive, right? You have all those ultrasonic sensors on your bumpers. Oh, the garbage can's right behind you. Doot, 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 doot. And nope, nothing's behind you, right? So what happens is this is where your digitization, your analog to digital conversion happens. And it's very, very, um, for lack of a better word, it's, it's very simple. Like what happens is this will essentially convert your analog waveform that's being integrated on and it will say above or below and it will just make a binary decision. This guy on the other hand will create ah, an analog waveform and what it's going to do is it's going to go, so here's your input signal. So let's say that's X of T. And what happens is this stream, what it's going to do is it's going to take this binary output, this one or minus one, uh, sorry, one, one or zero. It's going to digitize, it's going to make it an analog signal, and it's going to subtract it off of your incoming waveform. That incoming waveform is then integrated. It's sum. So you're basically taking the difference, you're integrating it over some period, and then what you're doing is you're saying, is it above or is it below some threshold? And then from there you make the call whether it should be a one or a zero, right? You're basically digitizing it. And what this will result in, what this will yield, this one I'm going to keep. Oh, yo, 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 yo. What you're going to get at the end of the day is something 
that looks like this. Essentially, what you're doing is you're using a one-bit, almost like a one-bit quantizer, right? You're, you're essentially, like, and this is why it's essential that you're sampling at a very high rate. Because if you're not sampling fast enough, your waveform is going to totally outstrip the, 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 you know, the, the quantization process. So essentially, what you're having is, should I go up or should I go down? So every sampling instant is like, am I below or am I above the waveform? Doop, 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 doop. And so that process, that diagram that I showed, enables you to do this, all with one bit. Should you go up? Should you go down? And you have to do it fast enough because you really want to avoid this sort of thing. That, that sort of situation, you're going to cause a lot of quantization error, right? On the other hand, something like this, you know, you're, you're pretty close to the actual contour of the waveform. So what you want is something that's fast enough that you can keep up with um, coming close to the contour of the incoming waveform. Yes? Oh, then it's going to uh, flip-flop. So it's going to go bloop, 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 bloop. And you kind of see that here. Like you overshoot, you undershoot. You overshoot, you undershoot. You overshoot, you undershoot. So good question. Good question. All right. So with that, that concludes um, lecture 14 of ECE 503. Okay. All right. So uh, what we're going to do...